the maturity of the apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher but the maturity of christ at that time he can call you and use you and any of the fivefold and just be natural just like growing up paul's talking about here about growing up but if we're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine every post on facebook shows we're not mature not only are we not mature but we're not satisfied in christ and we're not submitted to the headship of christ and the lordship of christ through the local church that's not tonight's message but it came up in something that i was discussing with uh with vicky and pastor matt earlier today praise god are you excited tonight Woo! yes when you look at 50 i don't know if we're going to get through it i'm going to do my best we're going to look at 50 reasons and signs that we know we're living in the end time but first i'm gonna i gave you a red herring last week i gave you a little i dangled a little carrot in front of your nose and at the end of the meeting pastor matt said you said there were two major things happening before the coming of christ and you said the first one was the fulfillment of the great commission what was the second one and i didn't tell you oh. ain't i a bad lad you're supposed to shout no no you're wonderful we love you we love you the bee's knees second thessalonians 2 now now we realize the first thing the first major thing there's actually more than two things but the first major thing to happen before the coming of christ matthew 24 14 who can quote it with me this gospel of the kingdom must be preached, preached in all, the all world nations as a witness to every nation ethnos and then will the end come the gospel must be preached the great commission must be fulfilled and there may be as many 6,000 reasons that Christ can't come tonight. So I was right last week, I said Christ wouldn't come tonight. And some of you, oh, yeah, how do you know that? A week later, he's still not here. How do you know that? Because we haven't fulfilled the Great Commission. It's so pertinent. That's why we're going out every Friday. We want to do in the world what we're doing in Brisbane. There are people called to do that. So firstly, and what's the second thing? The second thing is in uh, 2 Thessalonians. I don't know if it's best just to use my, my phone and not my paper Bible, probably. Second Thessalonians, most of the verses are on the board, but this one isn't. So I'll just pull this one up. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. It's very important. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 10. And it so happens that my Bible's already on that. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 10. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, in other words, the rapture, we ask you, brothers, don't be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Bad translation. King James is better. The day of the Lord is at hand. The Greek word is episteme, and that means at hand or imminent. Now, many people, fundamentalists, believe in the imminence of Christ's coming. Personally, I don't believe in the imminence of his coming. I believe he shall come soon, but I don't think he can come imminently. For the fact that I've told you before, the Great Commission is not fulfilled. Now, I'm not a heretic. I believe he can come in our generation. I hope he will come in our generation. And I believe he can come within 30 or 40 years if the church fulfills the Great Commission. There are unreached people groups in this land, even in North America. There are nearly 500 in China. Those groups all have to be reached before the coming of Christ. Okay? Now, the second sentence, this is, it says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come. What day? The day of the rapture, the day of the gathering together. Now, some of you say, well, the rapture is not a biblical word. Well, it is. When it says we're caught up together with him in the Lord, that the word caught up in Latin is rapturo. So it comes from the catching up, the gathering together. So the rapture is distinct from the second coming. What's the difference between the rapture and the second coming? The rapture is when Christ catches us up to be with the Lord in the air. We meet him in the air with the spirits of the departed saints who shall receive their body first. We won't get into that if you want to make a note. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Now, he says that they will not come unless they become a rebellion. The game bad translation. Uh, apostasia. The apostasy, the great falling away. That day will not come unless there be a great falling away. So there has to be a great falling away. We've got stats on it in a minute. We'll, we'll look at it in our 50 points. There'll be a great falling away before the coming of the Lord. And this is, 
going together with the fulfilling of the Great Commission. So there's a great revival and the great falling away happening simultaneously. And what grace, basically, the falling away and the great revival are, they're, they're opposed to each other. And that is this that I so often say that you'll see great churches like in this warehouse facility, but then you'll see little chapels that are closed down and being used as architect uh, studios. I'm thinking one now on College Road, Pancake Palace, downtown Brisbane. But then you'll be driving out to the Gold Coast and you'll see Dunamis. And you'll see places like we went the other day, C3 Church and Victory Church. And they're bigger than those chapels that have closed down. So at this, the falling away is from the traditional modernist um, nominal denominational churches. And the great revival is coming in a revival of form. The church doesn't look like the Anglican chapel or whatever. And I'm not bashing Anglicans. I love Anglicans. There are some great Anglicans. And um, Nicky Gumbo, one of them. And so the, the point being, though, is that there is a, a two things going on at the same time. And we often see this in the Bible. Some people say, well, why is there a church always talking about a great revival of a billion souls? Doesn't it say there'll be a great falling away? Yes. But both will happen simultaneously. A breaking down, as Jeremiah was told by God, you were called to break down and to build up. You are called to tear down and to plant. So these things are happening simultaneously. And then what happens, it says, unless the rebellion, the apostasy, the great falling away comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The second major sign before the coming of Christ, we've got, um, we're going to put the falling away in there after the Great Commission. And then the revelation of the Antichrist must come, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against everything so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not know that when I was with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The spirit of Antichrist is already in the world today. Has been since the coming of Jesus Christ. So these two powers, the Antichrist spirit and the Holy Spirit, are working together in the world. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Is that exciting? So this is the beast, the, the, the um, Antichrist, the son of perdition. The coming of the lawless one is with the activity of Satan. Now you remember that I'm not making a point for post, pre, mid tribulation. I'm just saying the Bible says clearly don't say the Lord of coming is imminent, is at hand, is about to happen, or has already happened, unless the Antichrist has been revealed. That's what Paul's saying here. Read it, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 10. With all wickedness and deception, because they receive the love of the truth, and then God sends them strong delusion. So it's very important for us to realize that there must be a fulfillment of the Great Commission. There must be a falling away. There must be a revelation of the Antichrist. And that is followed by several things connected to the Antichrist. Now, the revelation of the Antichrist, it, it, you're going to have to study Daniel. This is not, I'm not going deep into this point tonight. It's just a, a, a little backwash on, on the screen of what we're going to see. But just to say, there are several things to occur that's going to happen. Now, the revelation of the Antichrist, if you look at Daniel, there's a covenant sign for a week, or seven, a period of seven years. In the midst of that week, after the first three and a half years, there is a breaking of the covenant. And this may come at this time when he's sitting in the throne of God proclaiming to himself to be God. Now we'll cross-reference that to Matthew 24 because the way to understand the Bible is you've got to read Daniel first and then you read Matthew 24 first and you go into Revelation. Don't start with Revelation. If you don't understand Daniel, when you read it, come ask me. I'll talk to you about it. I'll, I'll lead you through it. And then read Matthew 24. And if you, if you can understand that clearly, then go into Revelation. If you go into Revelation, you're going to be guessing. A lot of guessing on beasts and horns and and different things. I understand a lot of it, but Jesus said this. Remember in John 14, Jesus said this, I say these things to you that when they come to pass, you may know. So Jesus himself is saying, you're not going to understand even the simplest prophecies I'm giving you until they're becoming to pass. They didn't even understand the coming of the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit fell upon them at Pentecost. So that was one thing Jesus was talking about in John 14. Could they imagine the scene in which they were all speaking in tongues? Could they imagine the scene in which there was a rushing wind? Could you imagine a scene in which there was fire coming down from heaven and anointing them? Could you imagine a scene in which the whole of Jerusalem were gathered together, hearing the gospel in 16 different languages, 
3,000 converts were baptized that day, they couldn't. But when it was fulfilled, did they understand what he meant? Yes. So don't be proud. If Jesus said, I don't know the hour and the day, the Son doesn't know the hour of the day. Don't think that you're more clever than the Son of God. Because there's a word for that, my friend, and that word is pride. Okay. Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24. Now, this is very important. Matthew 24, as I said, we understand some things now. Uh, what Paul is doing here is putting a little flesh on what Jesus refers to, which is the abomination that makes desolate. In Matthew 24, uh, from verse 14, and, and as I say, I'm, we're not going to get into this very deeply. We're just going to broad brush it. We'll discuss it, and then you can come to me anytime and discuss this. I know there are a multitude of different opinions concerning some of these eschatological events or the understanding of the last days. Uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 24, and he starts this in, in 12. He says, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. So this is the great falling away again. <clears throat> Remember, the one who endures to the end will be saved. We have to endure to the end. Once saved, always saved. <coughs> Sorry, my dear Calvinist brothers, false doctrine. <laughs> <coughs> Sometimes you just got to say it clearly. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. I don't agree with you. <laughs> Come, and we'll have a talk together, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring out the Word of God. We want to understand what the Word of God says, not what, what somebody said in the whatever 1500s, I was 25 years old. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony. You see, Jesus is talking about this fulfillment of the Great Commission and this falling away happening simultaneously. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, what's he talking about? Somehow connected to that 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 says the Antichrist himself or the beast will sit in the temple of God proclaiming he's God. Now, is this figurative? <coughs> it could be figurative. It could be figurative. Now, I'm saying this because as we say, when it's fulfilled, we'll understand. Maybe remember the place of God. The temple of God is the human heart. Anything that takes the place of God in your heart is Antichrist. <coughs> now, I, I'm willing to believe, and now many people say because of that Thessalonians verse, the temple of God must be rebuilt. It must be a rebuilt Jewish temple. I'm not sure. I'm happy if that's true. I'm not phased if it's not. But somehow this is fulfilled. That's what I'm saying. You see, I know these events have to happen, but how they happen figuratively or, or actually in the way that we imagine with a rebuilt temple and an actual person sitting on the throne of God in that temple and proclaiming that he is God and asking the world to worship him, I'm not sure. Is that a physical, actual thing? Thanks so much. Okay, so Jesus says, let the reader understand, or, or the author of the Gospel of Matthew says, let the reader understand. In other words, what he's saying is your homework is to go back to the book of Daniel and search for the phrase, the abomination that makes desolate. Then let those that are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, as I said last week, parts of this prophecy are case specific. In other words, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, does this apply to us? No, we're not in Judea. 30 years after Jesus said this, 40 years after Jesus said this, there was a, a, a general, Titus, came down, a, a Roman uh, a general came down and he slew a pig on the altar of sacrifice in the Jewish temple. He was not killed because God had departed. The veil was ripped, and that means the Spirit of God had departed. So anyone could go in and out there, and they wouldn't be killed like they used to be. And Jesus said, no stone will remain upon the other. And what the Romans did when they burnt the temple was that the gold ran down and through the cracks. So they literally took up brick by brick and, and took the whole temple. But some of you say, well, what about the Wailing Wall? The Wailing Wall is not the wall of the temple. The Wailing Wall, when, when the, when the uh, mountain was, was scraped off and the, the earth was moved around, there was padding around it to make the temple mount and one of those retaining walls which someone talked about last week Vince uh, with a slab of, 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 of rock underneath it it was a retaining wall of the mound of earth scraped down on which the temple was built make sense so, so, so you got to know your Bible you got to know history and that they sing together perfectly uh, and some people have said well Jesus prophecy wasn't true because there's a wailing wall not the wall of the temple 
wall of the temple compound. See, you've got to know that, the history. Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled. So it was very, uh, this is very specific. I believe that this was partially fulfilled or intermediately fulfilled in the time, not of Christ, but of the first generation of the apostles. In other words, 40 years after Christ. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down. Now, we don't go on the housetops. But the Palestinians and Jews and those people in the Middle East live in flat, flat roof houses, which had parapets around them. The Bible says you have to build a parapet of of 18 inches or 36 inches or something so people don't fall off the top of your house. Well, we don't have that problem unless we're trying to paint our roof or something. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. We're not farmers. This doesn't appear, apply to us. Alas, the women who was pregnant and for those who were nursing in those days, pray that your flight not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath. Who's he talking to? Jewish people. I thought you'd all say Seventh-day Adventists. I'm really proud of you guys. <laughs> Yeah, he's talking to the Jews at that time. And so it's very important that we realize, although that's a fulfillment, I say a fulfillment, not the fulfillment, it's an intermediate, an intermediary or a, or a partial fulfillment because it still may have this fulfillment in the future that Paul's talking about in Thess 2 Thessalonians 2, when a man of, of perdition, the son of destruction, the son of Satan, sits in the temple of God proclaiming he's God. 